First up this morning, well, we carried some of it live yesterday. And I, could, could I say it wasn't the most dynamic public address I'd ever heard? Uh, Vladimir um, Zelensky addressing the New Zealand Parliament via video link yesterday through an interpreter who I thought spoke worse English than uh, Zelensky does, I understand, himself. Um, we pledged an extra th three million. It was a rather long rambling address that said, don't forget us. Um, here are the great things that Ukraine is upholding. Um, you'll also note that in recent weeks we've done a couple of interviews, or several interviews actually, about um, the situation in Iran and what has been described, uh, and I think it was a great term by one of the people we interviewed, the gender apartheid being um, practised in that country and quite a lot of pressure on New Zealand to do more there. Well, for what is probably uh, World War Three, notwithstanding the last time this year, um, we are joined by Professor Robert Patman, who has given us, I think, context and understanding about New Zealand's place in a pretty turbulent uh, uh, world. And I am glad to welcome him uh, back to the platform again uh, this morning. Uh, Robert, nice to see you. How's your end of year going? Good morning, Sean. Oh, pretty good, thanks. All right. What did you make of Zelensky yesterday? I'm going to be honest, it didn't set, you know, my wheels spinning. It seemed pretty pro forma. Um, yeah, I mean, look, he's got a lot of pressure on him at the moment. He's dealing with uh, about 30% of all electricity cut off in his own country. Um, the fact that he made the effort to give the, the speech to uh, New Zealand, I, I think, was an indication that he's trying to mobilise all the international support he can, which is understandable. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it, it it was, and I thought it was actually, although it was relatively short, I thought it was quite nicely crafted, the speech, because uh, for two reasons. Um, I, I think, first of all, he was saying to New Zealand um, that he wanted to consolidate the support that New Zealand's provided, and he also, I think more importantly, wanted to commit New Zealand beyond the conflict to the post-war reconstruction of Ukraine when, whenever that occurs. So, uh, and particularly in the area of helping to clean and try to mitigate some of the environmental damage that's occurred as a result of this illegal invasion by its authoritarian neighbour. So I, I thought that was interesting. And um, I think there was also a recognition on the part of Zelensky that um, New Zealand... Uh, the smaller and middle powers can do things which the United States itself can't do. For example, what do I mean by that? He did refer when he, he, he President Zelensky spoke about his global peace initiative or his peace formula, which he outlined in Indonesia a few weeks ago, a 10 point plan. And um, one of the aspects of that plan was to bring to legal account those people have been committing war crimes on the Ukrainian soil. And um, he recognises that the United States, which has quite rightly accused the Putin regime of committing war crimes, in my view, in Ukraine, is not a member of the International Criminal Court. Ah, that's but, right. Yep. Mu much of um, America's allies are. In fact, all of them are, yeah, Australia including, um, UK and all of them are basically members of the International Criminal Court say, and New Zealand is. So basically, I think he's looking um, not just to deal with the immediate situation, but long term. And of course, President Zelensky has had some very good news in the last uh, 36 hours, which is that the United States has finally, <laughs> after much pleading, made available the Patriot Missile Defence System, ah, which is the system... Which could Which, make a uh, huge difference. Ukrainians have been demanding. Mm. All right. So, yeah. Yeah. We've had a conversation, or, or what you said this morning, is all predicated on the idea that Ukraine will prevail in this conflict, and yeah. you have uh, called that uh, since we started talking about, about it, Robert. Is that still your assessment? Yes. Um, I haven't seen any dramatic reversal of Ukraine in the battlefield. Um, the winter conditions 
Um, I think, if anything, favour Ukraine because the Ukrainian troops are now better equipped. They've got warmer clothing. They're likely... All the signs are they're preparing another counteroffensive. Uh, I don't think the pressure is going to let up on the Russians. And um, the other thing is these mobilised troops are poorly equipped and some of them poorly trained, most of them poorly trained, and also ha lack um, the full equipment they need. Um, so what Mr Putin is able to do, he's able to use his considerable advantage in missile capability, and when I say capability, I mean quantitatively, yeah. um, rather than qualitatively, to try to knock out the civilian infrastructure, particularly the electricity. And that's where the Patriots water. come in, the Patriot missile system, yeah. which is an interceptor so missile from system. from Mr Putin's comes in. point of view, he may be facing, a, already, the yesterday, I think it was yesterday or the day before, the Russians launched about 10 um, Iranian drones which were all knocked out by already the ukrainians have got quite an impressive anti-missile capability the patriots missile system in principle in theory should further close the window uh, particularly against um russian cruise missiles so mr putin's one advantage at the moment has been in this ability to rain missiles in with I wouldn't say impunity, but with some advantage on the Ukrainians and knock out the infrastructure system. I'm not sure he, how long he's going to be d able to do that going into the future. And it's quite clear that the Ukrainian army has the edge on the battlefield. No war was ever won by distant punishment. Yeah, uh, the, yeah. War, the wars are won on the ground. Yeah, and um, at the moment the Russians have lost all the major battles. They've even mm. lost Kherson, yeah. which was their sole territorial gain. Right. Um. Uh, you mentioned there Iran and Iran providing technology or drones uh, to mm. um, to the Russians. And that, you know, I think in public consciousness is the other country right now that we might be uh, concentrating on. And we've done a num number of interviews here on the platform, particularly with women and uh, expatriate um, women from Iran. And I got given a great phrase yesterday, um, gender apartheid the gender apartheid being practised in Iran and calls, and the government did a bit, it's got this no travel uh, list of people, but increasing calls for us to become more involved and it's not a conflict, it, it seems to be an uprising or a revolution in Iran um, and people saying it is as important as what is happening in, in Ukraine and we should be as, as committed to helping, um, I, I guess, the forces for change uh, in, in Iran. Um, can we make a difference there, Robert? And uh, is the rest of the world starting to look at Iran as an issue that needs to be dealt with? It is, uh, I think, a very serious situation. And I think many of us have been somewhat surprised by the momentum by which the protests are gathered. Um, it, I think it's very important for our listeners to keep in mind that about 60% of Iran's 80 million population are 30 and under. Yeah. So it's predominantly a young population, which is bad news when many of those people are joining in the protests, which have been led by women. Mm. And um, it, it, it seems to me they've shown remarkable courage. We know that more than 300 people have been killed already uh, during the protests, including um, young women and uh, and actually in some cases children. Um, so this is a pretty brutal, repressive regime. They've also executed two of the protesters in the last uh, two weeks or so. Uh, I think it is important that New Zealand, which announced earlier this week that uh, it was putting a travel ban on some top officials, I, I think we probably will need to there's been cause for New Zealand to look seriously at freezing the financial assets of Iranian leaders, um, those who may have some financial assets in this country. We can't rule that out. Money's very mobile these days. Um, I, I do think it's important that New Zealand uh, contributes to the effort to help the protesters prevail. 
And uh, it seems to me that what we're looking at here is the biggest challenge to uh, the the clerical regime in Iran since it seized power in 1979. All right, it it it's different than Ukraine, though. You can, I, I guess, in narrative terms, it's easy to, see the, easy to see the goodies and baddies. And because of this term that someone uh, brought up with me yesterday, you know, gender apartheid. Uh, but there isn't a Nelson Mandela and it doesn't look like you've got a regime that is prepared to negotiate with its populace in Iran. It seems like it's going to get worse before it gets better is the only, uh, you know, that's the only analysis you can put on it. Yeah, I mean, there are links, of course. I mean, you've got uncompromising authoritarian regimes both in Russia and oh, in right, Iran. Yeah, yeah. They don't they don't compromise. That's not That's not in there vernacular um and um they insist on having a virtue a, a monopoly of political virtue um those regimes are particularly vulnerable against uh, popular protests you could argue that mr putin's nightmare scenario was that democratic ukraine would have something to do given the cultural and historical links between the two countries with the advent of popular protests in moscow i mean Mr. Putin saw popular protests in neighbouring Kazakhstan and Belarus in recent years. This is always a worry for authoritarian regimes. Um, yeah, the Iranian situation is, I think, serious. We may have been quite measured because we're keeping in mind, like many other outside actors, that a number of other Middle Eastern countries also um, are quite restrictive in the rights they give to women. And uh, although they're not coming out on the side of Iran publicly, because after all, there's no love loss between Iran and many other Middle Eastern regimes, Arab yeah. states, yeah. your regimes, it, it, there's no doubt about it that they may be disturbed by the prospect of a women's led popular uprising, which is successful. Yeah. Uh, but from a Western point of view, uh, I suppose it's a healthy development and it shows as we go into the next year, um, the authoritarian regimes are much, you know, they're fragile monsters in many ways, aren't they? Yeah. Um, they have the ability to coerce human beings in appalling ways, but actually they're much more vulnerable. And one of the things I'd like to add, Sean, is that at the beginning of this year, many of us were worried about how long liberal democracy could stand up to the onslaught from authoritarian regimes. Uh, at the end of this year, it seems that China, Iran and Russia have severe problems. Yeah. I was going to ask you to wrap that, and I was thinking back on the year in, in foreign affairs, we had kind of the Ch a China scare down in this part of the globe, didn't we? And, and you know... Yeah, uh, well, they I got think China remains for yeah, yeah. formidable economically. Um, yeah. But it's interesting to me that the regime... Um, the, pro the problems that have arisen, the popular protests, the resistance to the zero COVID policy in Beijing, um, the regime had two options when confronted with this resistance. It could crack down uh, or it could basically loosen or uh, moderate the policy. And they, they've chosen to do the latter, Sean. Um, Xi Jinping has probably calculated the risks of cracking down are too great. Mm. That is to say that if he cracked down and enforced uniformly his zero COVID policy, it could be disastrous in political and economic terms. He's gone for the softer option. How long he can persevere with that, we'll see. Looking back on, on the year that has been, and clearly Ukraine is, you know, is a worrying development, but give us your thumbnail sketch of the state of the world and global relations you know, is the doomsday clock ticking towards major conflict or have we had a relatively constructive year on the international stage? Well, I think it's been a picture of alarm and hope, Sean. Mm. Um, uh, we're undoubtedly continuing to experience and we're living through a prolonged and turbulent international transition. Uh, we have seen the revival or the intensification, I should probably say, of great power rivalry. But against that, we've seen something which is important for the small and middle powers, which is that most problems now, which states are confronted with, 
do not respect borders, whether it be transnational terrorism, whether it be problems of the global economy, whether it be climate change, whether it be pandemics. And this is important because it's not that our great powers in the 21st century are weaker. In fact, they've got more power than ever. It's just that they can do less with it because the problems they're confronting can't be fixed unilaterally, which in turn gives the smaller players and the middle powers much more leverage than they ever, ever had if they choose to use it. So one of the challenges for countries like New Zealand is to, to, to fully take on board that great powers can't fix these problems and they can't just rely on them to do so. And that in turn means that the smaller and middle powers have to get out of their comfort zone and say, actually, these problems can't be fixed without international cooperation. We've got to make that cooperation happen. Yeah. And uh, that, that's a major challenge. So I think we're in a very difficult transition. I'm not sure we can project, project with accuracy how what will eventuate during this transition. You know, there's a number of paths. I'm personally, perhaps I'm one of those half uh, glass full people. Yeah. Um, I, I personally think uh, that, you know, I always reflect on Churchill's expression about democracy, the worst system in the world apart from all the rest. I think going forward, as the world becomes more interconnected, democracy is not only the more economically efficient system, but I think it's a system which more and more people will ultimately, not necessarily in the, in the Western me, uh, model of democracy, but we'll want much more representative government going forward. Yeah, so I'm I was going to conf- say, I, I got a feeling of optimism from your general assessment there. Um, right, which, yeah. Which is no, nice. I, I feel, but I, I do think it's going to be a big long-term struggle. I'm not suggesting mm. it's going to happen overnight. I'm not suggesting the world's going to have one blueprint of democracy, but I do think authoritarian systems face tremendous problems from the technological revolutions that we've witnessed, not least in digital and um, Mm. uh, communications generally. It's very difficult for authoritarian regimes to insulate their populations in the way they have in the past and control what they think. And that's a major challenge to authoritarian regimes, which maintain they must have a monopoly of political ideas. Yeah. Um, Robert, I would like to thank you for the amazing contribution you've made to uh, my understanding of the world and our audience's understanding of the world through your appearances on the platform uh, in the last uh, seven, eight months. And we look forward hugely to hearing from you and getting your your takes, which are not cold. They are hot and good takes and they generally come true. We look forward to talking to you uh, in the new year. So thank you very much indeed Thanks very much for George. joining us. Oh. All the best for the festive season and all the best to your listeners. Thank you very much indeed. That is Professor Robert Patman, who really has become, I guess, our go-to guy on uh, international uh, events, particularly the war in Ukraine. But as he said, the issue in Iran also now a growing a growing issue. And I want to say I, I spoke last night to the only ex-Iranian um, MP uh, in New Zealand, that's Goraz Garaman, and I asked her why she hasn't come on the programme despite repeated requests uh, from the platform. And I got a rather embarrassed response from here and some other Green MPs I spoke to last night. Uh, But a kind of defiant uh, response from James Shaw. And loath as I am to talk about chatter at a party, uh, Mr Shaw made it clear to me that on his insistence, the platform is banned. Um... Green MPs have been told not to speak to us or grant us interviews. And some of them, I think, on a personal level last night, and I'm not naming names, thought that was a bit silly and hoped that they would revisit that policy in the new year. And I would say to James Shaw, it's not my job to set the policies of the Green Party, uh, but we are a platform that is about inclusion and understanding. And I think you do your party and your ideas a disservice if you play a silly I'm not talking to you game. And I'm going to leave that there and hope that in the new year, in the election year, uh, we can talk to Green MPs on any range of subject. And this rather childish ban that has clearly been in place, though never quite enunciated the way it was last night, um, that this rather silly game of you're not my friend, I'm not talking to you, 
I hope that ends with the Green Party uh, next year. So there, I got that off my chest. That's good now.